Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today with all of you. And um, I just wanted to say thank you because um, Diane has been asking me every year if I would come and do this. And I always say no. <laughs> um, this year, the reason I said yes is actually I've come across a couple people like myself who have a similar memory. And it seemed to me with what's happening in the world today that uh, it was perhaps time to share a little bit more in the hopes that it might op open opportunities for others. Excuse me for being so short. Um, <laughs> if you see me hoist my body up here, I'm just uh, trying to get comfortable. How's that? Is that okay? Oh, thank goodness. Um, well, first, what I really wanted to begin saying is that um, my work, as um, many of you know, I work as a medical intuitive, or that's what I'm called here. That's not what I consider myself. Um, but it's very convenient. So, um, the truth is, is I remember people. Whenever I have met people, they're very familiar to me. And that began when I was very young, you might say from the very beginning. Um, when I was born, instead of just seeing people as we traditionally do, I noticed a great deal going on with people, to the point of distraction. Um, some of you may know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I see a lot of smiles and smirks and nods and winks. Um, but what I would observe is lots of what I have come to understand as different molecular structures and their frequency and their density within the body and outside the body and in all living things. Although I must say, of all the kingdoms, you know, the mineral kingdom and the vegetable kingdom and the animal kingdom, I found the human kingdom rather attractive the most. And so I began to address this mostly with my parents. And every time I did ask them, you know, why does this man have um, a particular hollow spot in this part of his body or around his body or why are there so many lights traveling with him and why does he have a lot of company with him. Um, <clears throat> I was promptly um, sent to my room. <laughs> and um, that's pretty much the way it continued. Um, and finally one day, my mother said to me, where did you get that? And that was the first time when I actually began to recollect in front of another person the memory that I was born with. I should tell you that um, that memory occupies more of my lifetime in my own memory of self than actually my chronological years. So. I will only get to share with you little snippets of it. Otherwise, you and I would have to spend a great many weeks together in a slumber party after that and so on. And so uh, forgive me if it seems like I'm just kind of sort of slicking through it, but I think this is a good place to begin. Um, my first awareness is enormous, loving, all-encompassing, beyond words, all-creating light. I was present there. I was like a speck of a speck of a speck of a speck sitting on the nose of a speck. That's both my size and my import. But I did have some of the same substance, and that substance would mirror or reflect back the light to the light. 
you and I might call that loving, adoring, or worshiping, there's no choice in the matter. You just can't help yourself. I spent in my memory perhaps what we would think hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in that place. And during that time, I occupied a job. Um, genuinely, it's like a position as in where you're seated. You know how each one of you have a place here? But we'd also call that you would, you're holding a, a job while you're here. You're holding that space. In like manner, I held a space, even though it was a microdot. And my job was to witness the light. That's it. That's my whole job. Everything. Yep. Now you know me inside and out. And that hasn't changed today. Um, however, during my time in that space, I did have a recollection of more than myself. I had a tremendous recollection of all of us together in the light, past, present, and future, we were part of a single entity. Now, periodically during this experience, I became aware of something very important, that this was not the only realm, and that a very, very great, important work was taking place all the time. But I was not part of that work yet. And that is that those who would occupy a form were carrying the light into another plane. And that was their job. I would hear about it, of course, not with ears, because actually I was a little sphere myself. I had no need for anatomy. But I would hear about many different missions of those who had gone and had brought light to this realm. I was filled with awe and admiration every time it became known about such a mission. Also, I became aware of cycles. This must be something just part of my own nature, because it still happens. It gloms right onto me like a piece of gum. I can't help but to notice cycles and um, trends and patterns as they occur. Now, somewhere in this stage, of timeless time, I became aware of a mission. The minute I heard about it, some of my very few qualities rose up. And it seems in my nature, I had a quality of buoyancy and optimism against the odds kind of a quality. And when I heard about this mission, I just knew I was going to volunteer. And without thinking, with tremendous ignorance, but innocence, I found myself changing spheres. I moved into what you might consider a different segment of the light. Not as direct. Because if you're in direct contact with the light, as many of you who have had experiences know, it takes 100% of your attention. You don't really give a hoot about anything else. <laughs> so if anyone is going to uh, do more work than what I have been doing uh, preceding this, you know that suddenly the direct contact with the light would have to change. Now this only occurred because of my awareness that perhaps it was my time to render some service. And so I found myself, again, without any effort on my part or intelligence, 
in a chamber of sorts. And this chamber was within the light, but not directly. It was under the love and the rays of the all-loving, the all-giving um, creator. But nevertheless, there was a purpose to this chamber. And it was a place where you would not be as influenced. So I found myself there, having passed by what you might think of as very holy souls. They definitely recognize me, though I cannot say I return the same recognition. I had the distinct awareness that they had already done great things, and um, perhaps in the future I might become aware more of them. But they were those that many had turned to over a period of time on this plane. Now, in this chamber, I became aware of a powerful authority. <clears throat> if I were to describe this authority, I would say that any soul in its presence would have no alternative but to show phenomenal reverence, respect, awe, and surrender. For my benefit, since I was a giggly sort of a, a being, um, the, this essence, this great stature, this very significant master teacher put a cloak on, was cloaked, else if I looked at it, I was never going anywhere. So, at this time, I brought forward my understanding, and I volunteered with a little bit more enthusiasm of just a volunteer. It sounded a bit like this, although it wasn't through a voice, it was direct. I communicated directly into the light, and I said something that would sound like this. I can do it. I can do it. Just send me. Please, I can do it. Believe me. Believe me. I know others have gone, but this time, I I'll remember. I won't forget. I know others have forgotten, but I won't forget. It's really mine. It's mine to do. And so I carried on for quite a long time. <coughs> Instead of receiving a great deal of response, I only received one. And the response was, it's so different there. The tone in this message was full of sorrow, wisdom, warning. It was very sobering. The very sound of it made me quake. But I got over that, and I went back to my same stance. I said, you know, different? I like different, different. I can do this. I remember. Well, it's my nature to remember. And I got the identical response, but this time with more gravity to it. Now, lest you think I'd had enough and had wisdom, remember I told you I was sort of a little on the immature side, a uh, little innocent, a little ignorant. And actually, I say quite a bit of both. <laughs> I uh, said the same thing again, and I was given a great deal of information at that point. So that the information was distilled, and it would unfold over time. This I was given as well, the warning. Before I knew what hit me, it felt like I was being sucked out, inside out. It felt like a vacuum had sucked my inner essence. And that I went from being multi-dimensional to being flat and two-dimensional. And that was my first memory of being in utero. You know, you'd think.
think that I'd be kind of excited with the, the degree of enthusiasm of having volunteered for this. But instead, can you imagine what my first thoughts were? My first thoughts were this. Oh no, I failed the mission! And so I truly believed I had failed my entire life mission at that moment. And I worked very hard to stay conscious, but I was having a very difficult time staying awake. And the next thing I knew, I passed out. Now, this continued in and out as I began to weave my life over those months in utero. So I spent my time primarily doing two things. One, tuning into my carrier, my mother. I spent my time looking for the light in her, her mission, her health, how is her organs and glands functioning, um, what were her moods, because her chemistry was my chemistry. And also, I began to notice I could filter what was happening in the world by focusing on her. So I did quite a bit of it. It taught me quite a bit about what I was coming into, as well as the dynamics that would be featured in my life through my family system. The other thing that I spent my time doing is I devised a code for myself. And this code would remind me of everything in the before. Oh no, I was not going to fail just like that. And so I did. I devised ways to think one thought to myself which would actually contain whole files of thought. And so I had heard about the difficulties of remembering after birth, and I was gearing up. When birth finally came, I'm afraid all I remembered was passing out. <laughs> and once again, my first memory was actually uh, in my mother's arms, and I thought, oh no, I failed the mission. <laughs> and so I continued to work, to strive, but I was having an additional difficulty. I didn't feel terribly well. And as it turned out, I was born very sickly. And so, according to my mother, I kept telling her later on in childhood how I remember doing my best as an infant, doing my very best, but passing out regularly, <coughs> and having a profound sense that what they were feeding me in that bottle was poison. And she said, oh, it's true. She said, it's very true, you passed out all the time. We couldn't feed you at all. You would take two sips and you were unconscious. And she said, we didn't know better. We gave you formula, which turned out you were allergic to. So, you know, when you're born with weak kidneys and liver and lymph and you got all that pancreas stuff going on that's not functioning, it's hard to stay conscious. So I proceeded through my infancy, but this time I had a strategy. And I was having a hard time remembering. It was getting more and more difficult to remember everything. It was just slipping by, like you know those, those old um, hourglasses and you flip them down in the sands of time. Or that was me in memory. And so what I did is I worked on that code some more. And I etched symbols into the satin rim of my baby blanket. And I used this finger, because I knew this had power. And so I would scratch away symbols. And those symbols, as soon as I'd feel it in the blanket, I'd go, oh, oh yeah, I remember everything now. And that's what I would do as soon as I would come back from having conked out. And later on, my mother said, you know, when you were a baby, we thought you were very odd. Many babies, they like grab their blanket or they suck their thumb. But she said, not you. You just wove this little finger in the air and made the strangest designs and you're on the satin of your blanket. So I thought, ah, I remember too. You don't know what I was doing. So 
This carried on for quite some time. In childhood, I began to become more aware of people's health. Their health, their emotional state, and I spent a lot of time feeling grief. Because number one, I was missing the light more than ever. And I was finding it a little bit more lonely than I had anticipated. Number two, the older I got, the more I brought it up. Nobody wanted to hear about it. In fact, not only did they want to not hear about it, it made them exceedingly uncomfortable. And as I had previously mentioned, when I mentioned it at home to my parents, my latest observations, that was always rewarded with more extra time in punishment. And so I began to spend quite a bit of time in my room. Until one day I decided it was maybe time for me to pretend. And life got much better very quickly. Number one, I was out of my room quite a bit. And number two, I could carry on with my observations without feeling the judgment or monitoring of others. And so it went. Now, whenever um, I started to feel a little bit more lonely or a little lost, I began to have visions from age four on, very prone to visions. I spent more time in vision than I must say I did in the waking conscious normal state. And the visions would tell me of things to come, of things that had been, and they prepared me tremendously. The other thing that began to happen as I was older is dreams would start to foretell my work in the future. Now at the time, I thought that was pretty bonkers myself. That even topped my before memory. And I saw myself in one dream with a beautiful room and an enormous, enormous old-fashioned camera. You know those ones where they have to go behind it and, and there's a big, huge flash, right? So uh, I was behind such a camera, except it was a future camera. And it was my own. And I was very surprised in the dream. And on the floor of this beautiful room were markers. And I arranged humanity on these markers. And as soon as I would meet a human, I would put them on one of those markers, and then I'd go, oh, oh, I understand. That's how they evolved from the very, very beginning. So it was about them, but also about them in the collective. And that's what I do today. So as this continued, um, when I was 12, I met the sweetest neighbor. In fact, he was so kind, I thought to myself, there's got to be a reason that I could spend more time with this man. He was in his 60s at that time, and society didn't look well upon 12-year-olds visiting 60-some-year-old men just for fun. And he was a guitar teacher, so I knew right then and there I would be taking guitar lessons. But um, I practiced very poorly, rarely. And his kindness showed even more because he would say, you know, you could really be good if you practice occasionally. And so he knew I was coming to chat. And when I did, he would tell me about the world, the state of the world. Now I have to tell you, I have to go backwards for a moment and tell you that part of my before memory contained lessons of humanity that they had experienced through what we would call the, the earth springers of revelation. Prophets, the great teachers, the manifestations of God, the creator. And I was very attracted to global things. If it created division, I wasn't in the least interested. Not that I didn't recognize the truth within it and feel absolute adoration of it. But if people presented it with exclusion, um, I found myself having a physical aversion to it. But in that before memory, I also attained a recollection that would unfold later when I would find the Baha'i teachings. And as soon as I heard about them as a girl, I began to search 
or if they were true or just part of my memory. And so lucky day for me when my parents decided to move to Wilmette. And so that memory began to take place and unfold. Now back to my 12-year-old um, non-practicing guitar capacity. Um, my neighbor one day showed me a photo of his son who was an exchange student in a little country in Africa called Swaziland. And as soon as I saw it, I said to him, I'm going there someday. I'll be living there. And instead of him giving me a very kind but patronizing reply, he turned to me, he looked deep into my eyes, and he said, I believe you will. So many years later, though I had been packed to go um, for a couple decades, many years later that opportunity finally did come. And when I moved there, that began my work as I do today. And it started with a clunk when I met some of the traditional healers who said, we've been waiting for you a long time. You've made us wait a long, long time. You're just like us. And if you don't live your purpose this time, you will die. And they're kind of cheerful about it. <laughs> And they said, don't worry, if you still insist on not living your purpose, and then they recounted my whole life and me hiding from it and, you know, not talking about it and not doing it. Um, they said, if you don't, someone else will pick up your legacy. You'll just die. You know, and they carried on talking and laughing like this was, you know, dinner conversation. Well, I left instantly. I wasn't interested. And uh, the only thing that bothered me, it really got up my nose, how cheerful they were about my passing. And so um, before long, I actually did almost die. A friend of mine told me to put my hairs in order, who was a medical doctor. And I thought, oh gosh, now I really will fail my mission. So I went back. And um, the traditional, the elder of the traditional healers uh, said to me, you know, you have to spend some time with me. You really have to. And I said, you mean I have to go through a training? He said, oh no, you've already had the training. You have to graduate. And so I spent a few years um, visiting him uh, for a great length of time. And at the end, I was given a region to serve the people who lived in that region. And that's how I began the work that I do today. Now, jumping ahead, um, the books that you saw up front, um, The Oneness Model and Changes in Choices, I guarantee you I'm not a writer and have no aspirations to become one. Um, but they just came out of a wave of human need that was coming to my doorstep. That was impossible for me to possibly reply to each and all. And um, I have the dearest, best friend in the whole world. And she too does similar work. And so when we came together and prayed about how we could serve these situations, these books were born. And uh, she, uh, helped me come and put them together in the most unique and remarkable of ways due to her gifts. And so the oneness model is interesting as I'm uh, speaking to all of you today, in particular, because the oneness model is a metaphor. It's a metaphor based on my memory and many of yours. And it's a picture I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a picture of a pentacle with the point upwards. And that's what I used to only see when I looked at human beings. <laughs> that's all I saw. And you know how every soul has its particular aspirations. This center part of us see our head and our arms and our legs. 
This is also the way the earth looks. The earth has a core and the mantle and the crust and the surface, you know. We're identical. We and earth, we have a lot in common. And so does the rest of the universe have a very common form with us. And so it is reflected here. And it shows, that if you can see, there's these three orbs in the center of it. And I describe that as our core. So the center of that core is where most of us and near-death experiencers come from, the creator. We have that one down pat. We're familiar with it, we trust it, we come from that place. But many times people have had out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, or traumas that have taken them out for a prolonged period of time. They trust only this. And they are missing the rest of the model. This is a lot easier to just hover over the body than be in it, don't you think? <laughs> There's a lot of nodding going on down here. So our object, though, in life, what's important about not only the near-death experience, but anyone's experience, the journey that comes from, as I said, I've met a couple people this year who have had before memories like myself. In fact, uh, we have quite a bit in common with our memories. Um, and those who have had not only out-of-body experiences, but we find the pattern is repeated with any people who uh, delve into prayer and meditation on a regular basis. It cultivates the same awakening in the same faculty. In other words, you're using the true purpose of our existence all the time. Now, granted, when you have a near-death experience, it's a bit dramatic. You have no choice. Sometimes you don't even have much of a body to go back to. But um, the object of all these experiences, in my observation of our human trends, is one and the same, which is that we're supposed to live our divinely intended purpose now, together, not separate. And we're coming through awakening in the collective. Now, some of us are are waking up really quickly, and some of us are waking up a bit slower, and others are rather slug-like. Mm -hmm. But we're all going in the same direction, and we're going together. And we have a great influence over one another. And the object is to get your memory, the memory of you, in the presence of the Creator, in any way you choose to. And go through that second ring, which is a path of sorts, a sustainable path. You know, we, uh, it's become very popular in our generations to kind of look at the role uh, religions have played on the earth and criticize what human beings have done with them. But the truth is those pathways were only meant to be stable ground for us to walk on and be supported on to live our purpose. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel every day. It's hard work out there. And when you come with a memory of what path you'll walk, it will guide you. And you'll move into that third ring, which allows you to have a unique identity. Now, of course, I shared with you my very limited qualities. Buoyancy, enthusiasm, you know, it's not much to brag about. But I've met some remarkable souls, and many I'm looking at right now. And that comes when you remember more than just your attributes, but your attributes and how they play out here. What it allows you to do. What makes you unique? How is your mission playing out today and tomorrow and next month and so on? And our object is to get to the surface, that great and glorious surface. If we'll go there with even a hint of a memory of why we're here, we impact every living thing. It resonates. It thrills. It rejoices. I can tell you because I remember even from before how excited I was when somebody did anything. Sewed a button on with true purpose. And one of my dreams that I was given at a particularly difficult passage in my life where there had been a great deal of death 
suffering and loss around me personally. I dreamt, as always is the hallmark of these particular dreams, it's more real than life itself, and you don't have to write it down because you ain't going to forget. <laughs> and in this particular dream, I was in the next world. And um, gosh, it was spectacular. Everything was moving in the most extraordinary manner, but in this particular setting, I was being given the privilege of witnessing the noble magnificence of humans. Every person that I was witnessing in the dream actually had really been part of recent Earth history. And they were uniquely clothed or outfitted, though you know what I mean is not literal. But as soon as I saw a person, I'd go, oh, he was a street sweeper. And then I practically I could hardly get myself together to look at the next person because how glorious that was. You know what it means to be a street sweeper? It's keeping the foundation of our plane so, so pristine, so we can function together. That's the honor of that position. And so it went on. I got to see occupation after occupation, or so we call them but I got to really see what they were genuinely doing on behalf of all of us. And it was such a privilege. So, that I think probably should conclude the, um, for today anyway, the telling of my before memory, since it is the first time I have spoken personally instead of talking about what I do, just plain old talking about myself. Um, I wonder if any of you have any questions of any sort, lest I ramble on and we do have to have a slumber party. Yes? I, I do have some business cards to find them. They're not, I didn't even think to do such a thing. But I have some in my bag, and I'll make sure I get them. If you wink to me before you go, I'll, I'll reach out for them. Yes. Well, I have a unique job. I think it's an odd job myself. Yeah. I, <laughs> to this day, I can't believe people keep knocking on my door. But my job has brought me to working with people in about 30 countries. And it makes me feel like I'm sitting in a little bird's eye chair and observe what's happening with people. And because it always seems to come in waves. So if you want me to really address what I've been observing as of late, is that what you mean? Mm. Well. First, I'll tell you the most recent thing I've been observing, which is that there is a preparedness going on so that we function in the collective and get over ourselves. <laughs> now, how this is going to happen is really not significant, to tell you the truth. It's just happening now. The more resistance we have in our collective family, the greater the trauma to bring it about. And most recently, for example, the tsunami, um, which I myself was invited to be on that beach at that time. And it just never worked out. You know, I would have loved to have gone. But something always blocked my daughter and I from going on that trip. And it's very interesting, actually, because as a result, I've had many calls from people who have been connected to those in the tsunami. And I will tell you that this trend is also part of the trend from 9-11, which is that there are a great many people who are truly, consciously moving on to prepare others to do greater work here with less effort. It's not in vain. 
and it is truly remarkable. And no sooner do they pass on than many people sprout up all over the globe with a new recollection of what they're going to do. Last year they didn't know that purpose. Now they suddenly do. That's a remarkable trend. It's not related to any particular paradigm. It's not related to just healing and health sciences. They spring up from every little tiny imaginable occupation, teachers and scientists and dentists and People are trading in their old certificates for new ones, mainly to be of service. And it's been a beautiful trend to observe. Amongst other trends in the physical, I will tell you that cancer is spreading very quickly and will continue, as will problems with our pancreas in particular. And that is because, as you know, the pancreas' job is to process sugar every little kind of sugar. We love it. And it really is what processes all the sweetness we've experienced in our lives. When life doesn't produce enough of that sweetness, we tend to eat a lot more sugar. We're clever. We know how to stay happy even if it's by yourself at home with your Hershey bar. <laughs> But I always tell people who, you know, dig into chocolate, I always tell them, you know that's the cheater's way to heaven, don't you? Because <laughs> the truth is we're meant to live it together. Don't be shy. Come out of your home. But it's a lot easier to go back to the familiar. And we all come from societies that have been through a great many ordeals. And so whenever something happens, we tend to be more familiar with our past than of our future. And the last thing to change in life is food. You know, you can change a person's house, change their family, change their country, change their politics, but don't mess with their food. <laughs> Everyone seems to acknowledge that. And that's because we know it works, not for any other reason. We know it works. When the chips are down, eat the old history. Um, yes? I don't want to interrupt you. Oh, no, please. As a grandfather, listening to you refer to your young childhood, mm. I felt uh, that I would have wanted to wrap that little girl in a big hug because of all the rejection and so on that she was suffering. Mm -hmm. Did you experience, was your experience of that denial of your reality and what I would hear as rejection, did you experience that in a traumatic way? Oh yes indeed, I did. You know I had to be careful not to slip and say something that revealed too much. For example, in school I always knew the answers before the teacher would say it, but I didn't know the process. And I found school very grueling. And so, you know, I had to be careful when the teacher would oh, often have my parents in a conference and say, she always gets the best grades. I don't understand why she doesn't apply herself to work. And they'd bring me in, and of course, I couldn't really tell them the truth about that. I'd say, if I said, I remembered, <laughs> I know. That would cause a bit of an um, outrageous response, so I tried to fake it. But thank you for your warm and loving response. It, I feel it today, and I'm sure it has an impact on that previous state of myself. Thank you. Yes? We're assuming that your mission is under its way to be completed. I hope so, but <laughs> there's always time. <laughs> Once that's done, what then? Well, of course you move back to the light. Of course you're a new evolved state, which means you're slightly more wise and mature, we hope. Um, you know, when I say mission or assignment, you know I'm really not saying one thing. Because we all have many, many assignments every day. And some we have the opportunity to develop over time, and others only come but once. You know, have you ever had that feeling when against your normal routine, 
you think I should talk to this person or I should do something or I should go home a different route or you know I should say no to a free vacation to Thailand um, you know every bit in you goes but 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 <laughs> this seems like a good idea and another part of you says no you know um, that's a mission that's that's a, an inkling and also might be just the beginning. Sometimes you just need to get your feet wet, you know. For example, you would have not ever got me up here 10 years ago. If you'd paid me millions and zillions of dollars, I would have turned you down, even if it was in pure gold. And I didn't start talking at all, voicing my opinion, that is, expressing myself, due to um, the way I experienced life as a young girl. <clears throat> Not until an adult, and very late into it at that. <clears throat> so, little things cause me to get my feet wet, and then I show up, and then another thing is there to greet you. And that's the way people fulfill their purpose, because there is a divinely intended purpose behind it. And all those you will connect on that mission, and all that you will achieve, and all that you will remember. And if you don't mind, may I say something about that? another little hallmark of that. Um, you know, when we're getting close to that, I think some of you know this feeling, but it's so important to encourage in one another that it's always accompanied by a sense of joy. There's always energy. And it doesn't have to be logical or illogical, but it is present when you're about to encounter something that is important to you. And if you experience aversion, you should pay very close attention to it. That is the one creator, that's the light addressing you, saying, stay back. I'd say about maybe 10% of my clients have had clinical near-death experiences. And I always can't help myself but to ask them, what were you thinking five minutes before, an hour before, the year before? And without fail, they always tell me, Yes, I know what you're saying. Yes, it's true. I was heading towards that experience for some time. Yes? You said before that at times you could perceive someone's emotional situation that is beneath their physical ailment. Yes. How do you perceive the emotion? How does it register? Mm. Well, I must tell you, I've changed. You know, as a child, if I went to the grocery store with my mother, I came home sick. And it wasn't because of the food. It was because of what I was experiencing. Um, my parents used to say, you are oversensitive. You are too sensitive. You know, you've heard this before. And my father, who is, I lovingly tease him and call him the only Zen master in Wilmette. <laughs> he is truly very zen-like and always has been. He's an artist and um, taught all his children to meditate when they were little. Thought it was very critical. And he's just so sweet. But he used to say to me, when I'd get in trouble with my mother for perceiving what's going on and always disclosing it, unfortunately, um, he would say to me, you know, Jewel, the mind can only focus on one thing at a time. You need to focus on just your studies, or just the food at the store, or just the task at hand, and ignore everything else. Don't worry, it will just happen. And so you know I tried to obey that, but you know it didn't work. The more I tried, the more information I got about everybody around me. And so by the time I was in high school, my mother used to say I would collect the dispossessed of the earth. People would just line up at the house and come and stay, you know, and want to visit with me. And it's, of course, you and I know, it's because I was actually witnessing them in their reality, not in their dysfunction. In my work, I'm really observing what I would describe as God's plan, part of the, the um, you know, the greater plan. And I've never seen a single human blueprint damaged. 
I've certainly witnessed people go through the most horrific traumas a human can endure, but never have I seen it, the blueprint, damaged. It must be some kind of mirror image of our sweet soul. And that is impossible to damage. It's very comforting to know you can go through anything here and come out perfect at the end, whether you forget or not. But it's just so much sweeter when you remember. Yes? Going back to when you came in, and you're in utero. Yeah. And you're aware you're in utero. Yeah. Clarification now. Yeah. There's great debate going on currently in our society yeah. when life begins, when consciousness begins, when mm -hmm. the soul enters. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there's a big controversy. Would you say that your experience was unique, or would you say that is true of everybody? Conception, the soul is in immediately, and life <coughs> begins immediately. Not the first breath or three months later or whatever, you're in there. Would you say that's true for everyone? Thank you so much for asking this question. I was hoping to bring this about. Number one, I want to clarify something. My before memory, only I call it before. It's more convenient to me. But I just want you to know I have no beliefs about it literally being before. But you know our brain it's such a globby piece of stuff still. And we have to kind of put things in categories we don't do so well. We need this linear world. We need science. And so I only say before, but the truth is, we, uh, you know, for people who have had near-death experiences, they'll tell you, time can be suspended indefinitely when you're outside brain. So it might not be before anything. It's just my own recollection, and it could have been the very moment of conception. But it just took a heck of a long time. And as uh, my family and friends will share with you about me, I am a slow woman. So I guess I need a lot of time. And in terms of what I really understand, my own understanding, which doesn't make it so, this is just my own experience, of course is that um, when conception takes place, there's a great merging that comes together. And we could, like my experience, I think, is um, universal. I, I don't think, actually, I, I know it's universal. But due to a lot of our cellular density, histories, genetic patterns, brain function, nutrition, environment, family systems, and just keep on going, beliefs, uh, we interpret that differently. I have noticed when I work with people, it shocks me, most people go into shock somewhere between conception and a couple months in utero. Wouldn't you agree? We, we just go in shock. It's a bit much. I shared with you my piece of it. I hardly hung in there at all. And um, I think it's because you're moving from the, um, an awareness of infinity into finite. And I think that's just enough to make anyone want to go back. But do you know that neurologists recently have done some studies and discovered more and more have proven that the first three hours after conception takes place, our nervous system is formed, the very complete embryonic nervous system. Though I am myself not a researchist, um, I have had the privilege of um, hearing other neurologists speak. And so uh, that's a fascinating concept when you think about it. That means from the beginning, before anybody knows we exist, we're fully operational. We may not be wise and mature, but we got it going on. Pleasure. Anyone? Yes. Notice what Shan said. We're all unique and special and wonderful, and we all have a gift to give to, to the world or the universe that no one else can give. Mm -hmm. You found the gift, or you know the gift that you can give. Can you see the gift that others can give? Yeah, that's my favorite thing of all. <laughs> uh, did everyone hear his question? Yeah. 
So, yeah, and you know, the truth is, it is a wondrous thing. The human spirit is truly marvelous. You know, in my practice, I um, can tell you the truth. I have to do like the rest of the world. I book appointments. I hate it, but I have to. You know, otherwise it would be quite a jam in the living room all day. And, you know, I could spend the rest of my life with one person and never fail to be amazed, moment by moment. That's how miraculous human spirit is. And I feel that anybody who is here is a remarkable soul. Remarkable. Just the courage of showing up every day. It takes really something very special. Oh, yes. You said something about uh, you are a faith, you are called a, no, I'm sorry. Oh, a, what people call, a medical intuitive? A medical in intuitive. Country. Yeah. But that's not what you really do. That doesn't describe what you really do. That's so true. But you have to be able could to think it. Could you attempt a description for us? Translate the code into something meaningful? <laughs> well, What I, what I do is when I'm addressing a person, I am observing them from the point of view of my understanding of the plan and the creator and how they fit into it. And so if the body is showing a malady, it's my job to be, have no opinions of my own whatsoever to observe it and to articulate it as pristinely as possible. I find that does a number of things. If you address a real human being as they were designed, something happens in us. The molecular codes change. We rarely address one another in our reality. I, I find sometimes it's unbearable, and I think many near-death experiencers suffer excessively because of this, because they were loved. They were accepted for who they really are and seen. It's not that we aren't humble about it. It's actually a great irony. The more you're witnessed by the Creator, or any other person who sees you in that way, the more we don't have issues with our gifts. Oh well, I can't take credit for it, I didn't make it. And when that happens, the body also, which is nothing more than our shell and vehicle, our holy throne of the habitation of spirit, it responds. That's just from that standpoint. But in my job, I do have to address more than that. You know, if somebody comes with certain ailments, I have to determine, is this new? Is this a pattern? Is this a genetic code? Does this come from emotional toxic debris? Does this come from a bad habit? Does this come from something they have no idea they're participating in? Does this happen because they were born with this burden? You know, for example, if I work with a male who is born of an alcoholic father, we know in science today that their brain is shaped differently at birth, and they are an alcoholic from day one. They didn't do a single thing and drink a single drop, but there they are. They're going to have some special work to do in this life. It's really a wonderful privilege when I get to address such a person and let them know I'm aware of how hard it is for them every day. It has nothing to do with worthiness or how hard they're working. And if they fail, I still admire them all the more. Let's get to the root of it, and we'll look and see where they're still stuck participating in the pattern. So to answer your question, my real job is to observe the human blueprint in all its manifestations as best as I can, of course, remembering that I am um, not in charge of the plan. All I get to do is maybe help a little along the way, and uh, it seems that that helps us quite a bit if we want to evolve 
And another word for evolve is heal or change. Does that answer your question? I, I need a slumber party. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. I have the answer. Particularly praise on those who have weakness in the pancreas. And it also preys on those whose lymphatic system is at full capacity, or the liver chambers have already been full up with all their work they've been doing. You know, because their job is to filter the toxic debris, and that's what the lymph, you know, lymph nodes do. That's one reason. I'll tell you another reason that it's different from men to women. The answer is not the same. But as you know, that uh, globally we do not yet live. Um, the equality of men and women. We in the States are very blessed to have it in our laws. I had the experience of living in a country where actually there are no laws for women at the time I was there. So all those years, actually, a crime, oh my goodness, there was a king, there was a queen, there are princes, and there is a parliament. But if a crime happens to a woman, it's actually not a crime. It's only a crime if it happens to a male. Imagine what that does to the body, the form of carrying that. If you have to endure for a short period of time, oh, we've got amazing emergency systems in the body and the brain. Ah, oh, incredible. But what about long term? It's not going to work. And also, putting that on top of the grief and despair from crime after crime after crime that's committed against you or perpetrated for your other female children or sisters or friends, the body begins to weep. And there's a beautiful, in fact, that reminds me of a beautiful quote of a um, British doctor, I think in the 1700s. He wrote in his diary from his experience. He said, if one doth not allow the tears to flow, somewhere else doth the body cry. And you know, this is what really I would say, maybe that is a better explanation of my work. Uh, I'm, I'm there to look for a little detective work, you know, and then we get to the root of it and we pluck it out like a nasty thorn. Thank you. Have you had enough? One, how are we doing? <laughs> oh gosh, okay. Yes. Blueprint. I know, nobody does. Okay, well then you do have it. You've got it. For each human or for human as a species? Yeah, yeah. Both. That's why the oneness model, really, I was hoping that it would give people their own tool about their own blueprints and everyone else's. Because really, those five points of the pentacle in this metaphor are supposed to be emblems of multiple strands of cultures that we live in on the earth. So they're in our cells, these cultures. One is the culture of survival. Have you seen a lot of, have you seen enough on CNN to know we've got whole cultures of us that live in survival? And these aren't just cultures as in national cultures. These are belief cultures, masculine cultures, feminine cultures, academic cultures, financial cultures, scientific cultures, academic cultures, political cultures. So these points actually delineate these cultures we've all been reared in, both collectively, because we just know it when we're born. We just suss it out. We go, ah, oh, I'm here. <laughs> I have my work cut out for me. But we have personal cultures. These cultures are the true cause, in my humble observation, of disease. If you were raised from slavery, generation after generation after generation after generation, and you have been raised in a wonderful family, very conscious, very awake, and you have received the privilege of an academic education and reared in that culture, you really think that's enough to get you over the cellular imprint of all those years and generations of slavery. What that means is that person is well on their way to evolving on behalf of many others who've suffered. 
But truthfully, they're going to have their hands full. Anytime something smacks of prejudice or service without freedom, they're going to have an internal reaction. And we have to become sensitive to this. This goes on with us every day. We go into shock and trauma every day, all of us. Anytime something triggers a place where we have not been given freedom or recognized in our blueprint, we begin to register it in the physical as well. And our neurochemistry changes. Why do some people have high levels of serotonin and others none? You know, or, or is dismally low. Why is it so popular to medicate children today? You know, certainly the assessment is correct. We need to understand what's changing our chemistry. But would you want long term that solution to come from something outside when the real weeping is within? Excuse me one second, I made a promise. Bless you for your work. And we're so grateful. And of course, you've got my prayers, and I'm sure the prayers of many here. Thank you. Yes? Do you have any thoughts about using Ritalin and other medication mm. to treat ADHD? And well, in my experience of ADD, ADHD disorders, and uh, problems, um, it always seems to me that we should first look at the adrenal glands, which, you know, where stress is received by the body, and find out why this person is repeatedly in a survival mode of the body, where they're emptying out, you know, there's about 150 plus precursor hormones produced by the adrenal glands. What is causing that person to empty out those hormones, you know, the, the aldosterone, which is a great stabilizer, and testosterone, and the adrenaline that they need to live in this world. Um, and I think Ritalin, like all pharmaceutical medication, is critical when you're in an emergency. If any of you have ever had surgery, you wouldn't want to go without the anesthesia. And Western medicine is critical, it's noble, and it has been evolving at a rapid rate, which is truly remarkable. And we need to appreciate always the science behind um, every condition, you know, what it tells us. At present, Ritalin does help people 
function when previously they couldn't. Now, I do have a different opinion when it's about children because it seems to take quite a toll on the liver and sometimes their kidneys permanently, and that is of great concern, so I would hope that Ritalin would be used with caution. And presently, you know, in Western medicine, um, it is so busy with itself. This is a, a, because of the, the level of disease, you know, that we're seeing. But there's so much research going on and very little time to create bonds with other, uh, let's say, awarenesses in medicine. In this country, of course, it's not possible because there isn't an interest yet, uh, though it's growing with individuals. Myself, my clients are, some of them, very fine doctors and surgeons, and they are looking for new ways to serve their patients. It's very encouraging. But, you know, in Germany, um, in recent years, part of their medical school curriculum is that they learn about other modalities of healing. They learn about um, other sciences, homeopathy they have to learn about, acupuncture, herbal treatment, nutrition, so that what this actually stemmed for financial purposes. They were losing patients by the boatload. And so what they decided is if they taught their doctors as part of the curriculum to study other complementary um, strands of medicine, they could actually be still the one in charge. And say, why, well, Bill, you need to go see a homeopath. And come back to me after that. And, but what, they, of course, they were doing was weaving a wonderful bond of unity. And, um, and, the, and it's growing very successful in, in Germany. We are, of course, in a whole different system here. And, you know, money, as you know, and power are behind it. But those can be easily worn down. Hey, no hand. Oh, uh, one more. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to get to um, Julie, I have an eight-year-old um, who says she do has always said she doesn't fit in. She came to the wrong planet. She's having a tough time here. And mm -hmm. as a mother, it's very difficult to see this. And I don't really, I mean, if you feel felt like that's how you grew up, what do you do as a mother? Tricky business, that. <laughs> Well, number one, she has you, which is a blessing, because you're aware of her, and that's the greatest gift that she's been given. So the fact that you listen to her, and I'm sure she has a lot to say. Mm -hmm. From day one. From day one. She came that way. What you're really allowing her to do is you are mirroring to her her reality without judgment. So there's no glitch for her future because what happens in our wiring is the mother is the first emblem, the first representative and introduction to God. So you're already giving her a positive future. She won't have to go the bumpy road. The second thing, of course, is if you allow her to connect with like-minded children um, and search for children who are sensitive, this is what they usually have in common, like your daughter. They're very sensitive, they're very loving, they're overly concerned with news, what's happening in the world. My own self, my parents forbid me to read the newspaper or watch the news by the time I was eight. She, she's not news, she's how can they be cutting down the trees? Yes. How will people live? Yes. How will people breathe? Don't they yes. know what they're doing? Yes, she's such an angel. So she needs to be in environments that cultivate hope. Finding children's classes, for example, I don't know if you're part of a religious program, or, or a, um, but you know, children's classes on Sundays, not our old vision of Sunday school that made children want to run with their arms flailing in the opposite direction. <laughs> but there are so many wonderful groups now that have beautiful children's classes. I know like the Baha'i community has open children's classes and there are about very general principles, love and kindness and unity. Any place that cultivates that for her, introduce her, see what she how she responds. Does she find herself feeling comfortable? That's your key. You know, art classes, creative classes. Besides music, and not music, besides dance, if yeah, dance and music, I don't know anywhere that she's ever said I'm comfortable. Yes, I believe you. 
I believe you is very hard in this world, you know. Um, but I do encourage you, your research is just beginning with her, and she's such a treasure, that one. And she's very, very sensitive, so she has to be shielded from influences that are, um, let's say, those who have a negative viewpoint, who have um, an agenda. She should be shielded from socializing with such children. Anyone else? Do we have time? I think more. Um, yeah? Well, can you tell us about the, the wisdom of the uh, universal awareness that the healer or healing community in Swaziland taught you or showed you? I mean, why did I go through it? Or what is the wisdom of Swazi people? Or, or, yeah? Or indigenous people. Indigenous people. Well, you know how I was... Contrary, contrast with the technology-based Western medicine. Mm, oh, well, that's quite easy. Um, uh, first of all, you know how um, I was talking about this pentacle, this metaphor, and talking about how we are reared in these cultures, you know? One of the lesser known strands of cultures in our society, greater society, are cultures of spirit, where all kingdoms are seen as equal. You know, for example, in Swazi culture, amongst the healers, if a snake goes by your house, you go, Oh, my uncle's coming. <laughs> you know, and you have to go, And you got that from. But there's. It's such an immediate knowing connection because all the kingdoms function together under one code or covenant. And that's the belief. Now, think about that, which is what is rich in indigenous cultures amongst people still, even in the poorest of the cultures. Poor meaning they've lost a lot of self through quote unquote civilization or you know, the materialization of those regions. Um, there is a kind of a thinking that happens that's holistic. It is non-exclusive, it is inclusive. And amongst traditional healers, which I've met a great many from all over the world, they have this in common, which is when they look at the patient, for example, in Swaziland, their diagnostic tool is something that is given to them by an unknown person who is an elder who is not from the tribe, who it will be handed to when the time is right, who will recognize them. And it's a little uh, mat, kind of a little woven mat. And then there is a pouch, and it contains shells and bones and coins and symbols, and sometimes oh, all kinds of things. It's amazing. And each one denotes your family structure, your ancestors, your maternal side, your paternal side, um, disease, health, wealth, career, you name it. It's a very complicated system. And when they throw these bones, as it's called, they will ponder it with great wisdom. In their hands, they'll throw it and they'll go, Oh, I see you've just moved away from illness. Well done to you. Or, and they'll say, Ah, oh, looks like you're about to have a visitor. Oh, and your maternal grandmother, I see she passed away, what, 10 months ago? It's very precise. Now, with that wonderful tool, what they're really doing is seeing more to you than just disease. They're acknowledging your part of life. And sometimes they would say things like, you better be careful, you're associating with people who are performing witchcraft. You're going to get sick. Now, when I introduced my friends who are medical doctors to these folks, the minute they used the word witchcraft, they all went running. But I encouraged them to stay and ask, what do you mean by that word? And I went and pestered one of the elders for weeks about just that word. Turns out, he's really talking about the ego. <laughs> Now that makes sense, doesn't it? And so 
they really are very, now I'm talking about the uh, traditional healers who came to it through a calling. I'm not addressing those as the elders that I um, was befriended by warned me against. They said, Julie, don't just hang out with any of the traditional healers. Not anyone who just hangs a shingle. And I'd say, well, why? We're all serving humanity. And they'd go, hey, 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 hey. you have a lot to learn. You know, and I thought, oh, it's just like back home. <laughs> some people are in it for the prestige and some for the money. And, you know, we bring what we are to our tools. Does that answer your question? Okay, okay who did I miss? Because we're getting, we're down to the wire. In fact, we're one minute past, so I'm afraid we're there. Thank you all very much. You've been so wonderful. I can't thank you enough, Julie, for coming today and talking to us. I think it was a wonderful experience. I'm sure it will uh, reverberate. A long time. Uh, don't forget next week, uh, next month, 